First off, you have three Bs, basically. Their job is to mate with the queen, and that is about it. They don't collect, they don't forage, they have to be fed their whole life, and so they're there to simply mate with the queen, and it also bolsters the hive, hive health. They like the drones around. Um, when it comes to coming into winter, like this time of year, cold nights, the, the, all the worker bees in the hive will start carrying the drones out of the hive, throwing them out the front door, and they, they're done with them. They don't need males anymore. They die. You'll see piles of drones outside your front door. The workers are, are the other, one of the other bees in the hive, and they're the ones that do all the foraging. They collect water, they collect uh, pollen, and nectar, and propolis. And they're the ones that do the work in the hive. They do pretty much every job in the hive is up to the workers. Um, is it true that they're sexless? The workers? Um, well, they're females. They're, all the workers are females. Um, but they don't lay eggs, generally speaking. We're going to get into that, because <laughs> they can. But generally speaking, they do not lay eggs. The workers are just there to work, take care of the queen, take care of the drones, you know, do their thing. Um, so they are responsible for every job in the hive. And the queen is the one and the only one that lays eggs, and she's just laying thousands of eggs. And that is her only job, pretty much. Um, let's start handing some of these around. Here's... A drone being born, and you can tell the obvious difference between a worker and a drone. Much larger bee, much larger eye. They, they, you can just tell by immediately by looking at a drone. It's just a big old fat looking thing. So the drone is. The drone is just coming out, and they have to be fed immediately. They have to be groomed and fed, and as soon as they're emerging, he's just coming out of his his uh, cell there, and. And as soon as he does, he's got to be fed right away. And sometimes they'll, you'll see them emerging, and they'll be sticking their tongue out. And like before they ever get out, they're like, "Oh, come on, feed me!" So, <laughs> so that's that. Um, and they, they do have to be fed as, as well as the queen. The queen is a much different looking bee. All the workers are all around. The queen is here. Um, not a great picture of her abdomen, so you can't see her as well, but this one's a little bit better, I guess. Yeah, so you can see the queen's abdomen is quite a bit longer than than your average bee. Um, it's still somewhat hard to spot them in a hive when there's 20, 30, 40,000 bees you're looking through, but there's a trick to it. And I said this yesterday. It, we, I don't know, it's probably been like when I was a kid, so years ago. Um, they had these pictures and prints that if you kind of unfocus your eyes, and this 3D image would pop out at you. The same kind of technique works really well for queen hunting. You just kind of don't focus on the bees, just kind of scan and just let your eyes, you know, don't, don't try and get your mind in the way. I mean, you're, don't get your eyes in the way. Your mind is going to pick out that queen. And so you just kind of scan and just kind of unfocus and scan and scan. And when there's 20 frames in a hive, that's a lot of work. But to narrow it down, the queen is going to be generally in the brood nest. Anywhere where you're finding baby bees, she is going to be in there. Anywhere you're finding eggs, like the very small eggs, you're going to know that you're close to finding her because she is going to lay thousands of them a day. And and she'll just be laying in, in these cells, just laying and laying and laying. Um, so once you get, that's kind of one of the tricks, is just look for where the eggs are, and you know the queen's probably close by. An egg takes three days to hatch, so if you notice that, you know, the eggs are, are starting to elongate, and they're kind of starting to lay down, and, and they turn into a kind of a coil shape, then you know, okay, well, those are a little older. So look for the eggs, and then as soon as you see the eggs, then start searching for that queen. So you'll have to search, you know, wherever the brood is. And I say generally because they break the rules all the time. <laughs> so just one of those things to make it easier on yourself, but it does not foolproof. And, and so we can pass that one around too. Um, let me see. Uh, da -da -da -da. This is a queen cell. Okay, so here's where 
the queen comes from. It's not a very good picture of a queen cell, but I can kind of explain it to you. It's basically like a peanut, and there's several different kinds of queen cells. Um, emergency cells are formed on the on the face of a frame. So, say say this hive <clears throat> for some reason the queen just died, or you know, there, it can happen whether, you know, treatments are being put on or something and, and the queen just doesn't like it, they kill the queen. And so emergency cells are going to be formed on the face of the frames. So this will fill up with, with emergency cells and sometimes you'll pull out a frame and there'll be just cells all over it. And they kind of look like a little peanut. They'll, they'll do a depression like this and then they'll, in one of those eggs that's in the cell, they'll turn it out and they'll draw it down so it looks like a little, almost like a little peanut hanging there. And that's the queen cell. So when you see a frame that has bunches of them on the face of the frame, you know that it's an emergency cell. They had to, it was something that happened and they had to make one right away. Yep, it could be stress, it could be, generally the, the queen is not there anymore. If they're making, if they're making emergency cells, generally she's or not there she's anymore. All of a sudden not laying right. Yeah, or she's not laying right. They start off as like a little teeny egg, and it almost looks like a grain of rice, but like a really small, teeny grain of rice. And so that's the very first step. And then as it hatches, three days, and it'll hatch and become a coiled larva. And then it goes through its, its pupil stage, and it becomes an adult bee. Any egg in the hive that's a fertilized egg, which is a worker, any of those worker eggs can become a queen. It just depends on what they're fed. Um, the bees will take the, the brood food, which is the, the pollen, and, and they chew it up and mix it up, and it's a pre-digestion process it goes through. And so the, the worker bees will take it, process it, it's called bee bread, and they'll, you'll see them storing the bee bread. And people refer to it as pollen, but at that point it's not pollen anymore. It's, a, it's gone through its, its pre-digestion process, it's been mixed up, and they use their their juices to to process it, pack it back in those cells, and then they need that to consume. That's their protein, so they're going to consume that, and they're going to produce royal jelly. The royal jelly is fed to all bees. The the worker bees are fed very dilute royal jelly. The queens rely on a very concentrated royal jelly, and you'll see it's really thick, very white, kind of slimy really salty tasting um, and that is what they that's what they need to make the queen to make a really good queen you need a cell that it has a lot of royal jelly in it she needs to have enough to feed her the whole time she's in that cell so very important um, that when you're when you're looking at a hive if you see a hive and you all of a sudden you see oh yeah all these emergency cells that are formed on the hive. If you see a bunch of emergency cells, first thing you can do, you can make a choice. You can go in there and you can cut any of the ones that don't look like they're going to be good cells. You want a nice large cell with lots of royal jelly. So you look at those and kind of judge them and, and pick one out. If you do not see any that you like or you're worried that the queen was failing or starting to fail, then you need to decide to pull a frame from another hive and give them eggs from another colony that's a good colony. And so any of those eggs will, oh, they're gonna make a queen. As long as the egg is good, they, they will make a good queen. Okay, this queen was starting to fail. And this is kind of what it, what it can look like. I had a, wish I had a larger frame, but you'll see the brood is usually really flush to the frame and it's all about the same depth. This is all brood where she was failing and so it's kind of popped up and it, it looks like it's, you know, it's not the same height as, as the ones around it. It's, it's some are low, some are high. Um, so this was a failing queen and she started being a drone layer, which when they fail, they're, they're out of, they don't have any more uh, semen and so they, they're, they're mating flight. You know, maybe they didn't mate well enough or maybe she's just that old that she ran out and so she doesn't have any more, she can't make fertilized eggs. So then she just fails, they'll try and make a queen from that and she'll fail because she's, she's not gonna be a good queen, she's not gonna be fertile. Um, why, why would she make 
Why would she keep laying drones? Once she runs out of semen, she cannot, she has no way of, of remating. She, they mate once and they'll last, you know, anywhere from a year to three years, four years, and they can lay for that long. It's just, it depends on how well they were mated and the whole, the whole, you know, a lot of different. <laughs> On, on, well, one mating experience. Yeah, she can go out several times, leave and come back to the hive several times, but it's always over a very, it's a very limited amount of time. In the first three days, when she emerges, like she'll come out of this, once this queen cell hatches, the new queen comes out, she's a virgin queen, and so she's gonna run around the hive and, and check it out, and she likes to run around and she will find all the other queen cells she can, and she'll chew into the side of the queen cell and push her butt in there and sting the other queen before it comes out because she wants to be the queen you know she's born she's like i am it and so she'll run around she'll chew all those other cells and she'll sting them and she'll make sure that she is the queen um if that being said if there's another queen in that hive when when the virgin emerges the virgin will hunt the other queen down and she will do the same thing she'll attack and kill the other queen so that's kind of basics. We'll talk a little more about that when we get into swarming. Um, but that's the basics that, that they need those fertilized eggs to make a queen. And that if, if you have a failing queen, you never ever want to use eggs from that colony or let them build cells from that from that brood because it's, it's not going to be good and it's just a huge waste of time. <laughs> It's, it's a process. They secrete the royal jelly, the workers do. Yeah. And that's just when they, they'll ingest the, the brood food and, well, we call it brood food, but it's bee bread, and they'll ingest that and then they need that to, to produce the, all the proteins and everything that's in the royal jelly. So, yeah. so that's that process. Um, I'll pass this one around as well. You can see the, how a bee grows, the stages it goes through. So when she's born, she's got three days of, in, of hive work to do, and during that process, the queen is strengthening her wings, getting ready for her mating flight. And then she'll go out, she'll mate, could be once, twice, three times, but she'll mate with as many drones as she can. And once she mates with a drone, the drone, his innards are ripped out and he falls to his death. So, um, so being a drone is kind of rough, you know. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> so the ones hanging out in the hive are just hanging out. The drones that are hanging out, yeah, they're just waiting for something to do. There, you know, they people have uh, Joe, one of the other ladies. She's a, also a. a hobby beekeeper and she was reading something that said that uh, that they're actually needed for hive communication and I hadn't read that before so they um, she was saying that she had read something where the drones are actually needed for hive communication and interhive communication between you know other hives so um, it is one of those weird things where a drone will be accepted into any hive it goes into it's it's a male it's not there to steal anything it's it's they'll generally be accepted as long as it's not going into fall when they're going to kick them all out. Yes, it's lovely. <laughs> okay. Hmm. I don't know. I've never heard that. But they all have their own sound. They all... It's, it's one of those things, yeah, they, they have this... They emit this sound. You can tell if a hive is queenless a lot of times when you open the lid and they have a different hum. They just, it just sounds off and it's the first cue to, oh, I think this one might be queenless. We better check it out. And so, yeah, they do have different sounds and smells to a hive. Um, that's just when you're opening your hive, you want to start off by as soon as you crack that lid, you, you start your process of making a list in your head. How does the hive smell? How does it sound? How's it acting? Um, is it angry? Is it, is, are they settled? Um, if they're real settled down and they're real calm, they, they're generally on a flow, bringing something in. So, 
you know they're not as aggressive during that stage um, if they're if if you notice you know a good hard hum and when you open the lid they all arch up and they're you know really aggressive you'll know oh yeah there there could be something wrong or maybe the flow is tapering and they're not happy about it um, a lot of different issues stressed yep so you can uh, you can tell a lot as soon as you open that lid just smell the smell of the hive um, you can tell if there's brood in the hive typically because the brood has a real kind of sweet almost pungent odor to it and it's it's just powerful it's it's almost intoxicating it's very powerful and in the spring you'll notice that smell really strong if you open a hive and it's springtime and your other hives look good and then they have a good smell to them you open one and it doesn't have that broody smell and they have a funny sound you you start right there and and do your checklist in your head oh this one might have a problem let's look and go through the process of that um, most common problems mites at this point in time mites For a backyard beekeeper, generally pesticides and herbicides aren't going to be as big a problem with a commercial beekeeper. They are more of a problem. Um, you just just because the commercialization and monocropping has led to massive, you know, everybody sprays. And even if you get one orchardist here to not spray, the guy next door is spraying and the guy on the other side is spraying. It is hard to get away from it these days. Everybody uses they think, oh, it's great, it's not harmful, it's, it's great. And, and if, if you know how it works, it's a glyphosate, it's a broadband chelator. And so it goes and attaches on to nutrients and it locks up the nutrients. So if you have a hive that, you know, you're next to somebody who sprays, they very well could have brought that pollen back in, turned that pollen into brood food and consume it to produce, to feed the brood. And the problem is, is all the nutrients are locked up. They cannot access the nutrients anymore. So they might be eating and eating and eating the, the brood food, but they can't make get the nutrients out of it. And so the hive will just... I like to suggest that people start with a minimum of two hives. You always want a backup. You don't want to have to like run over to the beekeeper and buy another nuke and repopulate your hive. You want to be able to do it yourself. So you have two hives and then if, if this one has a queen problem you can go right to the other one, pull a good frame of eggs and pop them into this hive and they'll make a queen. So you, it's a good backup to have. Unless you live real close to a beekeeper then you know you could work out a deal and buy a frame from him. And, and one queen can support both hives? No. One, one queen per hive. So what you're pulling it out of the other... Hive. You just pull a frame of eggs? Yeah. Right, and you'll take the frame of eggs and put it into this hive. And I like to mark the frame when I put it in there, just you know, put an E on top of it or something, or put an X on it so you know which one was the frame of eggs that you introduced. That's a good idea. When you start off a hive, <clears throat> you are either going to buy a package or a, a package of bees, and it's a, it'll come with bees and a queen. Um, or you can buy a nuke, which a nuke is simply the very center part of a hive. It's, you can buy three frame nukes, you can buy four frame nukes, and it's basically frames with bees and brood and everything they need to start their colony. Um, I, I like starting with five framers just because they bulk up faster. In the first year, they'll, they'll make your, you a honey crop. If you start with a three frame nuke, they just, it takes them longer to build up to that point. I like five frame nukes, but you can go with, with anything. I did start some two frame nukes this year and they did really well. I mean, they didn't, they didn't make much honey, but they did well. They're surviving. They, they brought in stuff. So, are there good sources for your bees and there are not so good sources for your bees? As far as where to get them? Yeah. Um, that is another, another issue of, of what kind of bees you want. Uh, you can go, 
Um, in Apis mellifera, there's all the subspecies of, uh, you can get Caucasians, you can get Black Russians, Italians. It depends on what you're going for as far as, you know, climate-wise, you might want to take that into a little bit of a, a, you know, into your considering that. But I, my first thing I like to do is suggest that people go with a hygienic queen. And there's lots of people out there breeding for hygienics right now. Um, it's like one of the hottest things people are breeding for is hygienics um, with, with hygienic bees they'll like say you had a frame here and you're noticing you have mites a hygienic bee like say this was a frame of brood here and this is a typical brood pattern is in this nice arched rainbow pattern and this this is all brood let's say um, what you'll what you look for is mites first, but then a hygienic bee is going to sense mites in that cell and it's going to start tearing them out. So you'll notice in hygienic hives, there'll be maybe some missing cells where they've started to eat the capping off and they'll haul that bee out and throw it out before it ever emerges. Because what they're doing is they're killing, they're throwing the baby mites out. And so before the mites can ever develop, they'll rip that cell out, throw it out the front door. What's that? Are the mites inside? They're, they can be. There's two different mites, Varroa destructor and then the tracheal mite. Um, tracheal mites are, you know, you can treat for both mites. It's they're, Tracheal mites just aren't as common now as the Varroa destructor. It's just, it's horrible. The Varroa mite, it, it's just, it's responsible for a lot of the problems we're having. And it wasn't in, in the area in the 70s and 80s. It, they just didn't have mites. Um, they were brought in from beekeepers importing bees from other countries that had this varroa mite and all of a sudden from that point it just spread all over the nation so there there's there is treatments that you can use um, for mites well there is chemical treatments and then there's organic and more natural treatments um, So let's say you, you bring your nuke home, say this in this case it's a four frame nuke. You're gonna take a box like this, you're gonna separate side to side. Hopefully you have some frames of honey. If you don't, you'll wanna run a feeder in it. I didn't bring a feeder. Um, I, I like internal feeders. Um, they seem to be less, less of a problem. So you'll pull one of the frames on the outside out. You'll drop in this internal feeder and it's just a black, little like almost like Tupperware box and you're just filling it with with syrup um, or sugar water which is you know the syrup that they'll use so um, honey would be better to put in here if you had frames of honey left over from previous years or you lost a hive and you you're, you need to start off and and you have frames of honey I would suggest just putting some frames of honey in the hive and then you'll take your nuke and you'll put your nuke in the center of that and <clears throat> queens will always come in a little cage and there's a cork sometimes corks in one end sometimes the cages can be wooden or plastic or that, a bunch of different styles of cages but you'll want to introduce that right into the center of those four frames you put in or five frames whatever the case may be you'll introduce that queen with the candy side of the queen cage down there'll be a um, all of them have a candy plug in them basically and it takes the bees a couple of days two three days to chew that candy plug out and in that time it allows the other bees to kind of groom her through the cage and feed her and transfer pheromones and it allows those pheromones to get spread all through the hive before she ever comes out so once she comes out and she gets out it might be a day or so before she really starts laying strong two days so when you've when you've put your nuke in you've introduced your queen stuck her in there you've you've pushed the frames back together closed the box up and you're not going to come back to this hive and touch it for at this point i would say don't go in there and touch it for two weeks leave it for 14 days the worst thing you can do is, is, you know, say she comes out of that cage in three days, it takes her to get out of the cage. When she comes out of the cage, if you decide, oh, I'm going to go in on day five or six or seven and crack it open and check it out, the bees will automatically hold that against that queen. For some reason, they do not like it. And you can smoke them, 
it just it's really hard on them so you want them to give them enough time to let her really start laying brood and get enough in there that they're con they consider her a really good queen so you want that that adjustment period and then they need to I would say 14 days before you go back in and check it and it's not whether you get a package or a nuke yeah packages are a little bit a little bit different because a package when they send it to you they they will have that queen in that in that package already so they've already kind of know her and they've gone through some days of being with her and, and so they accept her a little bit better um, I still wouldn't uh, suggest I mean she'll still be in a cage and I would still suggest putting her in there in the cage and make them go through the process of getting her out and so in 14 days you'll come back you'll check and by that point she will have laid some brood and, and she'll be on her way to, to doing it um, out, so that's considered a hive, and then you do the same thing with another, or can you stack This, that this is, yeah, hive? yeah, so this is your beginning, so that's what you'll start with. You just don't need the two boxes at once, so you'll put your lid on her. You'll come back in 14 days. Once you check and make sure she's laying, there's eggs, she's doing good, then you'll stick your second box on top, and you're doing all this in the springtime. It's the only time bees are going to be available around here. And so you'll give her a second box and then same thing you wait a week two weeks let her do her thing let her let him start working and at that point like in the springtime after that you're gonna start putting on supers and we'll get into the the, the kind of the year of beekeeping and, and we'll go through that so this becomes your hive it is two boxes that is the basic hive that's what's Definitely nukes. Yeah. Even with the disease issues, because they're going to be there in in packaged bees as well. There's going to they get, I mean, you're going to get a package of bees, and they might say, "Oh yeah, you know, they're mite free." Well, it's almost never the case. We got packages a few years ago, and they had hive beetles in them, and we don't have hive beetles in this area. So. It, it, packages with hive beetles, and that's that's not supposed to happen. It's not even supposed to be you know possible. They're supposed to check for that, but. It, it happens. This is just one queen in the two boxes. Oh, I see. Yep. The sec they, they need about this much room to to have enough brood to store their pollen and their honey and and so this is your working hive, two boxes deep. Up here, you might even make the choice to use a smaller, like a super, on top of this and leave that and call that your hive because up here they're going to go through more honey than they would if they were south of here. So. So you, you're going to want to, you know, make make that choice over the years. I've never had a problem with, you know, as long as they have enough, you know, honey up here, eight, ten frames of honey up here, then they'll make it fine through the winter generally, unless it's a super long winter. Um, so you want them to have enough to make it. And and a, I don't know, I do kind of like the thought of having a, another small super on top of this. Um, it gives them the room in the springtime to really move up into that super and have three, you know, three boxes with brood in it. And so that's always an option. It's kind of, you can work with that. People do things different and weird and experiment with things and it's fun. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, we have our bee yards are typically between 24 and 30 hives. Um, 24 to 32 hives. It just, you know, it depends on the area, how many it can support. It depends on, you know, the, if there's any other beekeepers around. You want to have your hives no closer than like three miles because that, the, what you're getting into is kind of like cows overgrazing a field. You're same thing with bees. If you put too many of them in a location, you're not only hurting your own bees, you're hurting all the native bees around because what they're, I mean, they're going to, get serious about it and they're going to hunt everything they can hunt and collect it and gather it and and they're stingy they get everything they possibly can and so you really you want to limit to how many in, in you know how close they are to one another oh you absolutely can yeah as long as you don't have a neighbor that's that's like right next door that has 30 some hives in a yard and you have another neighbor down the road that has you know about that many you, you just like two hives. yeah see two hives is not a problem you're 
the the problem would be more or less um, commercial beekeepers that have bee yards right in the area. Um, if they have a lot of yards, you might notice that your hives just never bring in as much honey as you think they should. Um, if somebody has six hives a mile away, that's that's no problem. That's not not bad at all. Yeah. A good thing in that instance to do is to take your outside frames and what I like to do is called checkerboarding and say you have your hive and they got all the frames filled except for let's say you know a couple on the outside um, then all these have a decent amount of brood in them and they, they look and they have a good size cluster the brood is all the babies in the hive yeah you'll know the male the the drone brood because it's it's a fatter cell it's more popped up than the rest um, all these smaller cells is the worker brood, and then all these large, fat, deeper looking cells is drone brood. So. And I'll just separate those and drop those two frames of foundation right in between them. Because what, what happens is the young bees, their uh, wax glands are overactive, like super active wax glands. So if you put those frames right next to where the youngest bees are, when they emerge, they're going to start drawing wax. And they, they have such active wax glands at that point that they can just draw wax like crazy. And so that's a good way to get them to fill out those frames fast. After it's warmed up. Yeah, after it's it's warm. It has to be at the yeah the right time of year. So, but typically you're starting a hive. It's going to be springtime, and it's going to be you know heading into the warmer weather. Um, like here, I'm I'm comfortable checkerboarding in March. Seriously? Um, absolutely. Yeah, because they're on the build up at that point. You know, they've they've already we have blooms coming out in the orchards, and and they're already working. And, and, what and area are you in? Fruitland. Yeah. April, I guess you know, so early the April. So yeah. Like exactly. It's all dependent on region. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. That, we do it down south when we're making nukes, and of course it's in. It's right on the Oregon border, and getting ready to send them up this way for pollination up north and so we'll make nukes and we'll do a lot of checkerboarding in early March to really, to really yeah well at that point they're already starting to brood up and get out there and the temperatures around 50 55 degrees during the day when we're working them um, so it's not the best weather and yeah it's all just depends on location and temperature and everything you don't want to you don't want to stress the hive out but you do want to want to get them to build up and that's a good way to really force them to to fill out and start moving and expanding base everything on the cluster size if you have a good size cluster in there that it seems to be expanding and it's doing well then you can do some of this if you have a small cluster then you do not want to start breaking that cluster up and pushing them out so kind of judging on weather and and the cluster size it's so many different things and so much to cover in an hour and a half <laughs> oh. um, Basics of beekeeping is, is decent.